911, where's your emergency? I need an ambulance right away. My son just overdosed on One of the movements that we are involved in is a movement called Recovery Out Loud. I've used drugs and I can tell you what life was like on the streets and using drugs. I'm a small town city girl. I was born and raised in Wilmington, Delaware. I sold dope since I was 12 years old. And I was raised by the boys on the street. I lived by what they told me. You know, my mom was pimped by my dad. My dad was on drugs all his life. He ended up being a heroin addict. These stories are among many of those who live to tell their deadly struggles with substance abuse. Free from the shackles of guilt and addiction, many have chosen to recover out loud by sharing their stories and letting others know that they too can recover. I can remember um, being a little kid, maybe around five, six or seven years old. My mom and dad divorced. My mom used to have a lot of friends over after that divorce. And I always knew when they were coming, right? Because my mom would, would, would take out the um, regular light bulbs and put in red or blue. And that's when I knew that all her friends were coming over. After they leave, me and my mom would be cleaning up and I would be sure to empty the remains of those cups and glasses. So it started off with um, alcohol at that young age. My mother married when I was five, giving me my first brother. She was in an abusive relationship with my stepfather. He was an alcoholic. My mom smoked weed and I, I watched all of this. Between nine and 11, I was being molested by my uncle. At 14, I got pregnant the, with my very first child. Then after my mother got killed when I was 15, I had my second child at 17, and I did what I had to do to take care of them. I started selling drugs. I was a drug dealer. I stole, I shoplift, um, I set people up. They, I got set up, I set myself up on many occasions, you know, because I always thought that um, this time I'm only going to do one. This time I'm going to stop. This time it's going to be different, you know, um, but this time never came. I never will forget one particular day. I was in high school and I went into the restroom and I saw one of my childhood friends shooting drugs. I was always a curious person, so I tried it. After high school, I came up with this bright idea that I could sit home and sell drugs while other people went to work. That worked for a while, but lo and behold, I became my own best customer. I went to prison, I went to jail, I became homeless, penniless, and jobless. My life had got so bad where I started sleeping in abandoned apartments in the projects. I was walking around picking up cigarette butts off the ground and I only had one shirt, one pair of pants, and one pair of tennis shoes. And I had worn my clothes so much that my clothes, my clothes had become torn and my tennis shoes and the sole at the bottom of it fell out. And I had to find a plastic bag to tie them up. It's really amazing that everybody else saw that I had a drug problem besides me. I've OD'd off of heroin numerous of times. And one particular day, my childhood friend and I was getting high. This particular day, he OD'd and died, and I didn't. I said I really want to quit. Some sick of this bullshit. I keep hurting my family. But they don't understand me. So I get up the nerve. Take off to a meeting. When you recover from something, you're rebuilding. So, I'm rebuilding my life at this point. I'm recovering from the way that I used to live. And uh, that means more than anything in the world to me. As I look through the window, I smile at the sun rain. I've been through some struggles, most led me to a grave. I come from the trenches, I come from the street. I done been so deep in the street that, you know, I was running from death even when I didn't think it was chasing me. I lost everything, everything, more than you can lose. I lost and lost and lost and lost. And even while I was losing, I, I lost even more, you know. Death in the family, my mother and my sister, you know, the biggest death I had to deal with, my cousin blowing his brains out. Um, another one of my cousins being stabbed to death. My father abandoning me in the street for a certain period of time after being a great father. Me going to prison, gang wars, real life gang wars with over 40 guys getting stabbed up. 
uh, you know, being in the hood and just, you know, trying to dodge death every day. For so long, the person that people saw most was the drunk person stumbling down the street, the crack addict on the corner begging for change. We used to be those people, but a lot of us through 12 step, through church, through whatever avenue we chose, we changed our lives. A lot of us are now productive citizens. We evolved back into society and you never know. You never know that someone's life has been changed. And so there are some of us who are now willing to tell our stories, to give hope to the person who didn't go all the way down to the bottom like we did, who may just be sitting in their living room drinking too much after work, not knowing that you don't have to go to the lengths we did because nobody told you. I've been clean for 25 years and on February 13th, 1992, uh, my life changed. You know, before then, I was one of those that we talked about, walking on the street. I had a family, I lost my children, was homeless. And I remember the last night that I used, I tried to commit suicide because I didn't want to live anymore. And I remember hearing this little voice to get up and go get some help. I was in East Lake Meadows and ended up at South Fulton Hospital. And I was getting ready to leave and the nurse said, um, stay, the doctor's going to see you in a minute. And I was like, nah, she said, stay, please. And I had been on the street so long. I had been talked to so bad. My disease had beat me up and I felt so bad because I had a college degree. And, but the disease did not discriminate. It had beat me up so bad that I didn't feel loved and I didn't feel like anybody loved me. But this lady seemed to care. Somebody cared about this dope thing. She said, please, and I said, okay. In 2016, 51.1% of Americans over the age of 18 have reported using some form of illicit drugs, while 85.6% have reported drinking alcohol at some point during their lives. Alcohol consumption can vary from person to person, however, when asked about binge alcohol use, 26.2% reported having binged the month prior to the survey. I could not or did not believe that I could get one day clean. The process was I had to go into treatment. I had to go into a detoxification program in order to detox because I couldn't, I, I had no idea on how to get clean. We're in the bluff right here in Atlanta, Georgia, in the West Side area. It's one of the areas that is hardest hit in drug addiction. And it's also one of the most prominent areas well, you can see where we're standing at. This particular meeting or this particular group is a very, very fortunate group in this area that we do recover from. We need recovery in this area and I don't live very far from here. I'm a breast cancer survivor. I had just found out that I was a survivor the month before I came in. Recovery has afforded me to participate in my family activities when I was using that was a really hard thing for me to do. What really brought me to the point of change was when on my 38th arrest, I stood in front of a judge facing 60 years in prison or 30 years probation. But it's just something about this time. I knew that I had a problem. It got so bad that it left me um, homeless, jobless, penniless. Um, I even lived under a bridge, not too far from right here. Matter of fact, I even used to wait on this church's chicken up the street to close. Um, so when they throw the food out, I used to have to go dumpster diving and get it. I would walk down the sidewalk. The church's chicken is right at the top of the street. So after I get the food, I would walk straight on down the sidewalk and I would start my incline. As the incline starts, I would start my incline. And I would walk up at an angle and um, pass that little first set where someone's occupied that space. and come on down about five or six more spaces under the bridge um, and I would be right there. That was my little spot right there. Right beside the red building, the, um, that's where the scrap metal building is. So when I got my aluminum cans or any types of metal, I would take them over there. And I had a hard time getting across these tracks with a, a cart from the grocery store. <laughs> Imagine that. 
I used to strap kilos of cocaine in my body and get on the airplane and fly them from Miami to Atlanta, from Miami to Virginia, and Miami to New York. And so when they called me and they said she was laying out there and she was bleeding because my mother was killed. And when my cousin called me and told me that she was laying out there, I said, so, I hope she died. And when she died, um, I didn't feel anything at, at the moment, but then when it sunk in, I held a lot of guilt because I said I felt that I had done that. And so I carried that guilt with me in a, a long time. And so a lot of my drug usage came behind to cover up the pain, to medicate the pain of enduring that. Before the funeral procession started, I walked up to his casket and looked down at his body. I heard God tell me, just like I'm talking to you, say, Steve, if you don't stop doing what you're doing, you're going to be in that casket next. That's what it took me to scare me straight out of 27 years of active addiction. After the funeral, I went home, fell on my knees, and asked God to intervene in my life because I tried to do it on my own for so many times and just couldn't do it. This program is beyond powerful because um, I came in here and I was always wanted by the police all my life. And um, I was in a program, a First Offenders Act, back home and they mandated me to yarns, they mandated me to do all kinds of stuff, and I thought I had the system down, and, but I kept using. I thought that I could beat the system, but I had to keep using. You know, and they kept telling me, and I violated probation. I never forget, I was axing out in the woods. I was doing all kinds of stuff, but I could not beat the system. You know, and I tried to do a geographical change. None of that stuff worked for me. Nothing worked for me. God planted me around with some people like me and I just happened to run into Miss Roselle Green, you know. Um, and I tell people I share my story, it was planted out like a chessboard. Everybody was in position. I never knew, but I needed to go through what I needed to go through. But because of this program, another chance of Atlanta, I had a felony charge. But they suggested some suggestions to me. And I stayed clean and I stayed around here and they kept reporting my urines back to my state. And, and because of this program, Another Chance of Atlanta, they kept reporting, I kept staying clean, and the judge, because of this program, dismissed my charges. It was nothing that I did, it was only because of God's glory and His grace, you know, because I did the crime. But I'm talking about favor. I'm so grateful and will always be grateful to this program and Roselle Green because because of that, I have been able to go above and beyond anything that I could have visioned or view. And that's only because of serving God. You know, he had, a, he had things for me to do. You know, even in spite of me trying to mess it up and mess it up and mess it up, he had things for me to do. So I'm just grateful that everybody was in position. This program has power. So if, you, if God lines you up to get into any program, especially this program, you to hit home. It's important that we always give each other another chance. You know, um, we believe in, in, in giving people another chance because somebody gave me another chance. So I think it's important, number one, that the name speaks to what we do. And then once we get a hold of you, you know, we're able to say, we understand, we've been there. And people who need help know when you're serious or not. And they have a whole lot more respect for you and they listen a little more when you can say, I've done it and I've been there. I made it to the other side. So we that give another chance, we're an, an example by sight. So I think that's, that's the important part. Simpson Street Church of Christ is a very important partner for Another Chance of Atlanta and for the recovery community in general. And the reason it's important is because they allow us to have six meetings a day, six 12-step meetings a day in one of their buildings across the street. When others in the community were doubtful about having people in recovery on their property so prominently and every day, uh, the church did not hesitate. I think that without that relationship, we would not have the level of recovery that we have here on the west side of Atlanta. Right now, our plans are, if you may allow that to happen, is that the former educational building that's across the street uh, is being uh, redeveloped and reworked. And our plans are to move the NA group out of there into this building that's more accommodative. There is no bossing or directing by us. They're given the freedom of operation. 
they are an integral part of this of the church in terms of utilization. We look at, at recovery as we do uh, the church and its relationship to sin. It's a process of uh, developing one's life in a more positive direction. And uh, that's not done overnight. They've got to have a situation and circumstances that help that. So recovery means for us overcoming the obstacle of substance abuse and all that goes with it. We've been in this area for 15 years. People see us go in that building. Some of us go every day. We're called those people. They don't know who we are. I know that there's a stigma that goes along with addicts, and we're here to say that we're willing to step outside of the box and bear that stigma until we can change it. Yes, I, I used to be an addict. I'm in recovery now. And, and I'm a productive member of society. For the people who's dealing with people lost on drugs, there's hope. Never lose hope on anybody. As long as they're a breath in an individual, there's a hope. Hope means an expectation of an expectation of something good is going to happen. I'm an example of hope. I'm 27 years drug free, one day at a time. And when we say drugs, that includes it all, marijuana and alcohol. But this thing goes a whole lot further than drugs. People bondage. This is my niece, this is Rosalind. She's very important to me in my life. She's not in recovery, but she helped me with my recovery. She's my strength and my hope, and I love her so much dearly. There used to be more liquor stores per square mile than anywhere in the country. There's heroin in here, a lot of drugs. So as a result, it has taken a toll on the people who live in this community. There's a lot of addiction, a lot of poverty here. But at the same time, we're here. We're bringing recovery to this community thanks to Simpson Street Church of Christ and thanks to people in 12-step programs who believe in recovery. I was a, a real fan and I still am of the 12 steps. So I wanted to have my organization have something to do with the steps. So I came up with Atlanta Step Up Society. I was bad, I, I, I was a homeless. I was totally an alcoholic, totally a drug addict, 100%. I stayed homeless for almost 10 years, skid row. I went from being a military officer to straight up homelessness, living in shelters. And my entire life is about recovery. That's who I am, what I am, and I'm going to continue to be that person until the day I die. Oh, my self-esteem was so low, I'm like, I can't get a job because my record is so long. So I said, nevertheless, what I will do, I will take, you know, because I called myself being a career criminal, I would take my attributes of a career criminal, which was cunning and being able to persuade people to believe my stories or whatever it was, that uh, scam I was trying to run. I decided I would take them and I would make them into positive attributes. You know, so when I did my resume, I said that I was productive in sales, um, that I ha was a people person, and that I was able to sw persuade people to see my point of view. So um, I put my application on Indeed, and I got a call. She called me back. She said, "Miss Lee, I, I meant to ask you some things. Um, are you a, a, a convicted felon?" I said, "Now." I will tell you, yes ma'am, I am a convicted felon. I'm a rehabilitated, reformed person trying to be an asset to society. And now all I'm trying to do is to ask you to help me to do that. She waited and uh, she said she needed to check some things. She would call me back. And she did. She called me back. She said, you know, I listened to your story. I listened to what you had to say. She said, and it's a little unorthodox. She said, but I too have a higher power. She said, and it's something about the way you spoke to me and you presented yourself that I do believe that you would be an asset to the company. We're going to get you interviewed and we're going to get you that job. I tell people all the time that help is out here. You know, you have to seek help or reach out for help. You know, because if we could do it on our own, we'd have been did it a long time ago. There is a way out. There is hope. We do recover. We do recover. I always take it back. It starts, it ends, and begins at me. And the thing is, is that recovery is wonderful. I never would have dreamed that I would be here, clean and serene, only by the grace of God.
I feel good. I feel good, you know what I'm saying, the weed man can't get my money. I feel good that no liquor store is taking my money. I feel good to give my daughter a 50 or a 100 and I still got money in my pocket. It feel good, so me recovering is helping me be a better father in my life. Through those 32 years of active addiction and all that madness and insanity that I didn't keep myself, I know that it was the work of the God of my understanding. If my higher power kept me through all of that, that he kept me for a purpose. And that purpose is to help someone else. My God, this is better than any holiday of the whole year. This, this is what gave me life, you know, um, when I thought I was dying. So I celebrate it more than anything. It's a powerful day to me. It means a lot to me in my life. We are recovery. You are